So, no. Right here. It's right here. Adidas, check. Popcorn, <laughs> and spirit. My dad was around 50. He got an African gray. He always loved parrots his whole life, so I was happy for him to get one after his retirement. That's an African gray. That's a that's that that's an African gray. Looks like one of them talking birds. Look at the eyes on the mother clucker. That shit look. That shit looks sus. As, I'm not even gonna hold you. He named the bird Kevin. My dad taught Kevin a whole vocabulary of words. And he actually trained him to understand the meaning behind certain words. Oh, no. Like, Hello, what's up, food, thank you, good, and a few others. My dad passed away at 70. And with that came the time to figure out amongst my siblings and I what would happen to Kevin. My brother and sister didn't want the responsibility of taking Kevin into their homes. Plus, their spouses were against it, too. But I couldn't bear the idea of giving him away to a new home. Kevin was and is one of my last connections to my dad. In a sense, that was his best friend. So I decided I would take him into my home. I put his cage in the den of my house. My house doesn't have a basement, so the den is considered the lowest level of the house. Kevin is a moderately noisy bird. He can be a chatterbox some hours of the day, usually earlier on. But later in the day and at night, he quiets down. When he's too noisy, I'll throw a blanket over his cage and that normally quiets him down. I watch TV in the den at night to keep him company. Then around 10, I'll migrate to my room to let him go to sleep. That's pretty much the backstory behind Kevin. I've been taking care of him for two years now, so I know exactly how he behaves and when he's acting out of the ordinary. Speaking of out of the ordinary, there was one night in December around 11 p.m. that Kevin started making sounds while I was trying to sleep. I sleep with the door open since I live alone and need to be able to hear anything if something's going on in the house. Hearing him making his squawking noises past dark, especially this late at night, was unusual beyond doubt and something was irritating him. I went down to the den to see what was bothering him. He was wide awake on the lower perch of the two in the cage. He looked at me and was saying things like hello and what's up and his name. All the while he was nodding his head up and down moving his whole body in the process as if he were dancing. I tried to feed him but he didn't eat. So I covered him with the blanket hoping he would stop. I was in the kitchen when I stopped inside because he was still making the noises. And I had a feel. Was name Kevin? Kevin got some Adidas blood in him. Come on, some shit. He wasn't gonna stop. Having worked the next day, I couldn't afford to lose sleep because of him. Adidas really blood. I didn't know what to do. I'm still to this day not exactly a bird expert. I went Adidas blood. Kevin got that shit. I'm talking about. He got exactly what everybody needs in the motherfucking world. He got Adidas blood coursing flowing through his veins. downstairs and uncovered him. He was still doing his little dance, bobbing his head and body and making his distressed sounds. It didn't click with me until thinking I heard something in the pantry closet a few feet away from his cage. Oh, shit. I walked over to it and hovered my hand over the light switch to the pantry, which was outside of the door. The door has one of those big glass panels that many pantry doors have. So when I flipped the light switch, I saw the outline of a body on the inside. My flight or flight response kicked in, and I chose fight. I opened the door screaming, trying to get my adrenaline rushing, and I grabbed the man in the pantry closet out and threw him to the floor. He tried to fight back, but I easily overpowered him and had him in what I could best describe as a chokehold. He was a 50-something-year-old homeless-looking man with a smell to match it. I yelled at him, who are you? Why are you in my house? He tried grabbing my face to possibly gouge my eyes or something but I continued to wring his neck and punch him. During all this, Kevin was going berserk in his cage. When the man on the floor seemed weak enough, I literally sprinted for the nearest phone and came right back and kept him on the ground while I called 911. The man was taken to jail, but he had no idea on him, nothing. He was homeless and had nothing to his name, and as such he was considered what some people call judgment proof, meaning even if I tried to sue him, I wouldn't get anything from him. He had raided my pantry closet that night and had opened jars of peanut butter, boxes of cookies and crackers, and all sorts of other box and canned foods. If it weren't for my dad's parrot, I don't know what else that man would have taken or done in my house. I'm grateful for Kevin, 
And I like to think part of my dad is watching over me and that bird. I was just about to say that same shit. Hold on, man. Quinn. Parlier. This story takes place when I was a junior in high school. Sus. For context, here's a little background information. Back in the day, I was a pretty involved student. Took all the hard classes and was in a few varsity sports. In one of these ways, I was always busy and didn't have much time for myself. Right. And part of me was thankful for that. It provided me an escape from a world where my parents had recently parted ways and my older brother had just gone to college. It was just me and my little brother then. He also was a swimmer and a smart kid in his own right. We were really similar, even to this day. But probably because of the stresses our family situation put on us at the time, we didn't get along, near at all. One of those wet winter days in the Midwest, I put in my time at school and swim, and I still had to sit down for several hours of homework. This time I had to write an essay for some advanced class that I wasn't really interested in. I dropped my swim bag at the door when I got home and looked around my house to see if anyone was home. Empty. Dad must be out with Reese at swim practice. His club team had the slot at the pool after the high school team was done. I popped in a mouthful of Cheez-Its and headed down to the basement to my office to get some school work done. Right. The house was a middle-class two-story with an unfinished basement with the exception of what I refer to as my office. From a career past, my dad used to work from home, but no longer did. I was the only one who used this place, so my family, or what was left of it, just called it Quinn's office. So I made my way across the concrete floors and unattached carpet samples down there to the one finished out room in the basement. I flicked on the CFL light. It was like any other night after practice. I still had hours of homework to do. So I turned on the computer and started typing away. I was typing, typing for what seemed like an hour, trying to bring to words to what the concept of hedonism and the picture of Dorian Gray meant to me as best I could, or as convincingly as I could. Out of the dark, I heard my little brother call out to me, Quinny, Quinny, come up. Almost reflexively, I called back to him, Reese, I'm working, what do you need? We would yell through the house like brothers do, but it took me a minute to realize I didn't hear him come home. I got no response, only for a couple minutes though. Again, I heard my little brother's voice sing out, Quinny, Quinny, come up. Wait a minute, hold on. You didn't hear your brother come home. But you hear your voice. I don't know. I don't know. A part of me is, is saying. That's your brother. And go upstairs. But then another part of me is saying. That's not your brother. You hear your name. But because you were so involved with work. You thinking. Ronnie. Lost my train of thought. Hold on. You think because you don't work, you hear your you hear your, you hear your name, that you automatically think that's your brother, but in reality It's a club yes it is. It felt strange hearing those words carry across the dark concrete floor. He's supposed to be at swim practice. I called back out to him, asking if he needed anything, but again, I received no answer. I thought about just starting my essay again, but the family situation was delicate at best, and I didn't want to be in trouble if my little brother actually needed something. I made the decision to get up and go find out for myself. I bounded up the basement staircase, the only way a high schooler can, and I called out again for my brother. Reese, what's up? I'm really busy. Uh -huh. I checked all around the main floor looking for my little brother, or even signs he was home. No shoes, no backpack, so he wasn't home, and there was no car in the driveway either. The only reason my dad would be gone right now would be to pick him up. Satisfied, I turned back for the stairs, when I heard my little brother's voice ring out, Quinny, Quinny, come up. This time, every hair in my body stood on end. It just didn't make sense. He had to be at practice, and if he really needed me, he would have come to me. I go to the base of the second floor stairs and called out to him one more time. Reese, what's going on? Are you okay? For a minute, no answer. Reese, I'm really busy. Can you tell me what's up? It's quiet for way too long as I stared up the dark staircase. Logically, I had no reason to believe anyone was up there until I heard Reese's voice calmly speak this time and not call out in a sing-song way those same four words. Quinny, Quinny, come up. 
What? I asked under my breath. I couldn't comprehend the situation. I did quick inventory of any problems. You're doing too much shit. You're doing too much. Like you doing. Like relax. Relax, man. That obviously that's not your brother. Obviously that's not your brother. Obviously that's not your brother. Go back downstairs, lock the door, and you know what? Well, shit. Tell Quinny not to, not that, no, you're Quinny. Tell your brother not to come home. You know? At this point, at this point, you playing this mother clock. Hold on. Mario, break in, wrong voice. A prank? I would have seen something at this point. It had to be Reese, and maybe helping him would make me a good brother. So I began up the stairs. My heart pounded with each step, and I was about to make the landing to the dark second floor. Then I heard the buzz of the garage door motor. I ran back down the stairs and looked out the window. It was my father's sedan, and him and my little brother got out. God damn. I stumbled from the window to the hall where they would enter, and I felt my heart almost stop beating. I collapsed on the floor and just started to cry uncontrollably. Hold on, you so... Who the hell was that? I'm confused. Alley, 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 alley. Alley, 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 alley. Who was that? Was that a tape? A recording? Of his little brother? Like. Oh my god, story number two. Is, I, don't, I don't know what, what that was. I cannot, I cannot explain that. This was like 15 years ago now when I was a kid. I was with my best friend Jackson at some abandoned family resort or bungalow colony type place in New York. Jackson? It was off a main road and then down a private dirt path driveway entrance. And it was a rather large property with a bunch of old abandoned buildings, including at least 10 small bungalows, a main hall, a few bathroom stations, and an indoor pool house. Along with that was an outdoor pool, a shuffleboarding area, and a kid's playground. Everything was old, run down, and with tall, overgrown grass growing over it. We found this place accidentally one time, walking down Route 209, but we didn't explore it that day. We came back another night. By the time we went, it was past sunset. The sun was kissing the sky goodnight. It was getting very dark, but we didn't want to come during the day in fear of getting caught and getting charged with trespassing. Oh my God. We brought along walkie talkies and flashlights with us to communicate to each other when we'd split up. We started looking around the bungalows together. Most of them looked the same and were relatively small. One or two beds each, a small kitchen and one bathroom each. Some of them had these little living room areas. Halfway looking through these bungalows, I split off from Jackson because he was moving kind of slow. I tried to enter the building that looked to be the main hall or office or something, but every entrance was locked. I walkie-talkie Jackson to tell him that the big building was locked. He didn't walkie-talkie back. I wondered if I was out of range from where he was. Two minutes later, I found myself at one of the two bathrooms. Y'all should have tested that shit. Y'all should have tested the range before y'all went in there. Before y'all split up. Y'all should have tested that shit. That's where y'all clucked up at. Buildings. It was probably a 400 square foot building. There were no doors to the building though. It was unusual. It just had two big openings. One for the men's room, one for the women's room. I remember the signs being faded and worn out looking. Then I saw these red tracks on the dirty old concrete bathroom floor. Now I'm not going to sit here and say they looked like bloody footprints. But I couldn't explain what these red marks could be then. And I still can't say for certain now. Regardless, it was pitch black inside that bathroom around that corner. And that was the first building I was scared to enter. I tried walkie-talking to Jackson again, hoping he was in range this time. I pressed the button on the walkie and said, Yo, where are you? When I let go, I heard the beep sound that the receiving walkie makes after getting a message from inside the bathroom. It gave me a near heart attack. Then I thought Jackson must already be in there, hence the red-looking footsteps. I called his name, and it echoed into the bathroom. I was actually about to step into the bathroom thinking he was hiding from me, pranking me, when I heard Jackson's voice call out from the distance behind me. Oh, outside shit. in the darkness of the night. I heard him getting closer, 
Couldn't see him in the dark, but he obviously saw my light. So I yelled back, I found your walkie-talkie. I started stepping into the bathroom, but then he said back, don't go in there, I never went in there. This is when I turned around and hurried right out of there. I pressed and released the talk button really quick on my walkie, pausing the beep again from inside that pitch black women's room. Jackson and I looked at each other for half a second, then began dashing in the direction we came. We made it back to room 209 and had to stop to catch our breaths. This is when Jackson told me that inside one of the bungalows he went into, he tried walkie-talking me, but I wasn't answering, meaning we must have been out of range. But then he heard a noise from the living area of the bungalow. As he turned around, his flashlight revealed an older woman almost running towards him. He dropped his walkie-talkie and flashlight and ran out from the bungalow. He ran in the dark and hid, refraining from making noise in fear of being followed. He hid for a questionable amount of time before looking around and seeing my flashlight across the field, over at the bathrooms. The most likely explanation to me was that some cracked out drug addict was hiding or living in that abandoned bungalow and for whatever reason lunged at Jackson and picked up his walkie-talkie. What she was doing in that bathroom, who knows. Maybe drugs, maybe the bathroom in the bungalow didn't work. But what I don't know is why was there a trail of what looked like blood in there? Those are my theories, but I can't explain all of it away. And that's the scariest part. The scary, nah, the scariest part was theory, story number two. Man, if y'all ever see something that looks like blood, smells like blood, tastes like blood, chances are it's blood. And it might be for somebody that you know. Or or, or not, you know? But if if you just see blood, you know what I mean, on, on something, and you know it's not from you, you got to get the hell out of there. Hey look, hey, look, man. Can we talk about... Can we talk about story number two, though? Please. Because I cannot explain story number two. Story number two, by far, is one of them stories that I cannot explain. What was that? Was that a, I don't know if that was a person. I don't know if that was something paranormal. And I don't know if that was something that was like, like a recording of his little brother. I don't know what that was. And I, would, if I was Sam, truth be told, I would, I would have shitted bricks. I'm not even gonna hold you. I would have shitted bricks when I heard uh, my father and my father come up, and I heard my little boy, my uh, my little brother, in that car. But whole time though, whole time. You you are at fault too because you uh, it's like that's your brother right that's your family so you should know how he acts you should you should know how he is so for you to keep playing these games with them you know what I mean you should have known from the jump that wasn't your not from the jump. Uh, Kind of from a jump. That wasn't your brother. I could have told you that. But, you yeah, know, I cannot, I cannot explain it. Well, maybe I can explain it. Maybe I missed something in story number two that would explain what happened right there. Because I was confused. But keep it cool, keep it classy, and I love to stay happy. My family.